Welcome to the Simplified Marketing Podcast. Straight talking ideas to grow your business. Hello everyone, welcome to our next episode of Simplified Marketing. My name is Andrew Black and I help trades get off the tools. I'm Georgia and I am your design and brand guardian. Make sure you don't make any marketing mistakes. <laughs> and I'm John Lawley and I'm your web wizard, making sure that you're found online and what's, what people see there is amazing. Um, before we introduce today's podcast, please, please, please subscribe. And if you want any more information about any of us or what we're doing, um, please click on the links below and go along to our website. So today's episode was all about Stephen Silverman from OGR Stock Denton. He's a litigation solicitor. John, you actually did this interview. What were your yes. biggest takeaways? Well, obviously it was very nice surroundings and I really like Simon and Garfunkel. Um, <laughs> takeaway number one, <laughs> in all seriousness. I thought, you know, because Stephen is a litigation solicitor. Um, there's lots of quite interesting things in there if you are a trade, if you're working in people's businesses, if you're working in their homes. Um, and it's about processes, basically, covering your own ass. Let's yeah. face it, it's, it's a big part of it. Um, but having those processes and procedures in place so that you are actually compliant with all the different regulations, health and safety, etc. But also record keeping. There's one really quite critical point, um, and I'm sure that from a trade's perspective, you can elaborate on this later on, but um, there's a really quite critical point that Stephen mentions, um, which is about record keeping. Because in any kind of dispute that comes up, um, a judge or whoever's mediating is more likely to see uh, notes taken at the time or contemporaneous notes as really being the key to right. any dispute. You know, what's there and then rather than the emotions that have been kept from later on. It's what's in black and white basically is how, how to decide things. There we go. All right, guys, well, listen out for Stephen Silverman from OGR Stock Denton. So, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for, uh, for letting us in the office. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself and the type of work I do as well. It's a pleasure. So, um, in your line of work then, you must deal with some very angry people. Um, yes, I certainly deal with traumatised people. And if people have disputes, they can be very angry. And uh, there is a, a certain skill to trying to take the anger out of a situation and to get a client really to focus on what the issues are in any particular case and what they're hoping to achieve. So how do you how do you build up the skills to be able to do that, to calm people down? Well, I've been doing this now for quite a long time. Started uh, <laughs> what was Osmond Gorton Rays uh, before we became OGR Stock Denton. Um, so I started that in 1986. So I've seen quite a lot of uh, angry people over my time. And um, you build up the skills really through experience and also um, just watching other people and how they, they deal with angry people. So if you could, could you explain a little bit then about the, the main parts of your practice and the main specialties that you have? Well, I'm one of nine partners um, in OGR Stock Denton. Um, I mainly concentrate on personal injury claims, um, accident, uh, that's involving accident claims, mm -hmm. Clinical negligence, where people have gone into hospital and not had the treatment, um, the, the appropriate treatment or something that's gone wrong with their treatment. And I also deal with commercial disputes, any disputes really that can involve property disputes, uh, deal with disputes involving manufacturing. Um, we've had claims against some of the large companies where things have gone wrong with products, etc. Uh, and also construction and building disputes. Um, one of the other areas we deal with, and I deal with quite closely with my partner Ian Pearl, is contentious probate claims. Um, it's a growing area at the moment um, where people feel that they haven't been given a sufficient provision in a will, or there's been um, an argument as to whether the person had testamentary capacity to make the will, yeah. um, and some other interesting issues which can arise as well. Wow, okay, so um, if, we, if we take certain examples from, from people who are going to be watching the show, if we're talking um, mainly to say business owners, what are the main points within their business that they need to be aware of and look out for? Um, well, quite a lot of disputes arise out of what was actually agreed between the parties as to what the person wanted you to do. So you may go into a house thinking that you're just going to do a chest of drawers using your analogy, but they thought that you were actually going to uh, also be varnishing the chest of drawers after you'd finished doing the work to it or repair. And then it all comes down to documentation. Documentation is everything in the dispute because uh, the courts, if the matter goes to a trial, will be looking at what the documentation was, what the contemporaneous notes were, any contemporaneous documents as to what was actually agreed. 
And of course, as a business owner, you really need to, if you're going to provide an estimate, it does need to be detailed, not just coming in to do some work on chest of drawers. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things to think about is what you're actually going to be performing if it's um, a type of commercial arrangement. Uh, also, quite often we find that people come to us when things have gone wrong right. and they don't actually know who they were dealing with. Now, if you're going into somebody's house, yeah. obviously it's the owner that you enter into the contract with. But quite often in business, people don't know whether they've entered into an uh, arrangement with an individual uh, who's a sole trader, yeah. um, someone who's dealing in a partnership or, or a company. And that can be very difficult because they're all very different types of liabilities and enforcements. And sometimes you can end up dealing with someone who's in a company and then the company can go insolvent and you haven't really got anybody to enforce your... Uh, judgment against, which is only a piece of paper if, if you obtain it. So, I mean, that's one of the tips to actually make sure that you know who you're dealing with and to make sure that your obligations are really uh, quite clear from the documentation. And from the start. Okay, so that's, that then leads into having very good processes then within your business, things that you have you've brought out and, and put in place. This is the quote, this is the work we're going to achieve. One of the things that you need to ensure is that if you've got any insurance in place, um, you're not going to do anything which would mean that that insurance would be affected at a later date. So okay. there may be something in insurance that says that you shouldn't put yourself in the position where um, you're left in charge of someone's property where there's valuables, because presumably if valuables went missing and you had a claim against you and you wanted to uh, claim on your insurance for that, then you may find yourself being in a position where, where you can't do so. I think it's all a matter of being sensible um, it would be possible for someone to pursue a claim against you if you had uh, left a, uh, a wire out or something which, which they came back and or went into a room and tripped over. So yes, you need to work in a, a safe system or tell people to not come into the room whilst you're, you're working on it, particularly if there's dust flying around and things like that. And how would it, so if someone did, if you are a tradesperson and someone, there, you know, the, the person that you are doing work for wanted to, or decided to bring a claim against you, is there a certain certain way to, to protect yourself beforehand or how would they bring that claim against you? How would the system work? Um, well, we do quite a lot of cases which are involving um, construction sites, for instance, hmm. where um, we may have um, somebody who's tripped over uh, a wire. Quite often they're an employee, but they can be a visitor to the site as well. And it's really a matter of making sure that you're have a safe system in place. If a person wanted to bring a claim against somebody um, for personal injury, and I have acted for people who have been injured um, on construction sites or um, employees who have tripped over wires at work, then you would have to show that the person undertaking the work hadn't done a proper risk assessment. Okay. Um, and so if you are the person going into a property or onto a site and you're going to carry out work, you should really undertake a risk assessment to show that you've um, you've you, you've actually taken into account the fact that there could be a potential risk of an accident if someone was to trip over a wire and what you've actually done about it. So, for instance, you've taped down the wires. And if you've got something written down, it doesn't have to be that detailed. But if you've got a risk assessment just saying that uh, assess these various risks and this is what I've done to overcome them, then you're going to have a pretty... A strong argument for saying that, that you've done something as long as you're working in a reasonably safe way. So you mentioned this earlier on about taking contemporaneous notes throughout discussions. What's the best way of keeping those types of notes? How do you know that they're contemporaneous with the time? Is there some way of um, setting those out and how do you format them? Um, well, it's, contemporaneous documents are very important and also any attendance notes that are made. It can be um, if you have a conversation with somebody about uh, a particular point that you think in the future could be challenged or there may be a dispute about it, then you know you can always confirm that in an email. Emails can be used to show this is what I actually said we were going to do at the particular time. Um, where you have difficulty if you go to trial is if there's two accounts of what actually happens on a particular day. A judge really has to decide who's telling the truth, 
they may, some of them may not be lying. They may actually just be misled, or sorry, uh, be mistaken as to what they, they, they remember. Because sometimes these disputes don't get to trial until two, two or three or four years down the line. Yeah. And um, it's not necessary that someone's lying. They just people remember things in slightly different ways. And then a judge will say, well, is there any documentation to assist us? You know, is there an estimate or is there any, any emails as to what was agreed at the time? Or do we have any plans or anything? And if there's um, contemporaneous documents such as attendance notes of conversations, emails or plans or things like that, then he's going to start off with those. And any evidence is going to be um, really uh, tailored around, around those and he's going to be uh, influenced by what's actually written as contemporaneous notes and will then can come then to the conclusion that a person isn't lying but they're certainly mistaken about what happened because what they're saying is consistent with what he's got in front of him on paper. So that kind of record keeping is actually is crucial. It is within, crucial, within it is crucial system. and one thing that's very important I do stress to clients in all disputes um, is that you must maintain all paperwork and documentation from the moment, or you should always maintain it, but particularly from the moment you know there's a dispute, you are under an obligation to give full disclosure of documents within uh, litigation. Those are documents which can assist your case, but it's also documents that don't assist your case and may assist the other side's case. And the courts have set out strict uh, rules relating to disclosure and as a lawyer, we are under um, very stringent obligations to tell clients from day one, you must not destroy any documents. And not only that, you must preserve all documents, including all email trails. A lot, a lot of things are electronic now, which actually makes it very difficult when it actually comes to working out disclosure because clients right. have to go through uh, emails and sometimes you have to get in expert companies that can actually um, put in various um, keywords into searches to find out the documents. I've got one at the moment, actually, where we've gone through that particular process um, in order to make sure that we've got all the documents which uh, have any relevance of whatsoever nature to this dispute. Because that must be quite a fascinating thing. I mean, obviously, in the electronic world, um, emails going missing, for example, or being hacked seems to be something that is uh, becoming more commonplace, obviously, especially in the higher echelons, I suppose, or if you're a political yes. party. Um, but, uh, but that's all evidence that can be used and documentation, which will be... Yes, yes. And so it, it, remember that the, uh, the person that you're pursuing or you're defending the dispute against, um, they'll also have those emails. And if it comes out at a later date that you haven't disclosed everything because you'll exchange your list of documents, if there's things on their list of documents which you quite clearly did have and you haven't disclosed, go straight to your credibility. And uh, <laughs> it can be very damaging. <laughs> so you have to have an explanation as to why you didn't produce a, uh, you know, a pretty vital document, particularly if that document doesn't help your case and it looks as though you've held it back. So would you, would you advocate mediation before taking things to court? Well, the uh, case law actually establishes that mediation is something which everyone should consider within a dispute, a okay. personal injury claim or, or any claim. And there's been a number of cases where companies or uh, people have gone to trial and at the end of the trial, the claimant has been successful. And then the defendant has said, well, you know, I know you've been successful, but we actually said we wanted to have mediation and you just refused to have mediation with us. And, um, you know, had you had mediation, we may have been able to come to some arrangement, but you just said your case was a dead cert and you were definitely going to court, you weren't willing to discuss. And, and the courts have turned around and said, no, you have one. Costs would normally follow the event uh, in this particular type. If it's a commercial case, it's not a personal injury case. Um, costs would normally follow the event. And therefore... Um, uh, but we're going to penalise you because you didn't actually mediate. Had you mediated, it may be, however successful, you know, however uh, much you thought the, the defendants were defending the case, they may have been prepared to, to do something about it. I see, OK. Um, and it can work the other way, of course, if you're a defendant and you just refuse to mediate as well. Even if you go on to defend the case successfully, um, again, you could be penalised in costs because you didn't actually give the claimant an opportunity to come along and tell you what their case was. And had you actually explained what the case was, the claimant may have felt a bit that they had some problems and, and, and some deals and things. Um, 
just also uh, as far as mediations are concerned, I mean, there are, there are, there are less and less cases going to trial. Oh, really interesting. Enough. Okay, so so that's a, that's the thing then. So, and uh, I imagine that one of the reasons for doing mediation would be to kind of take a bit of the strain off the court system, because and take away a number of costs. I imagine um, sort things out a bit more amicably. But um, I can imagine some people will want to be a bit more ferocious in their. Um, some people want to have the day in court, right. and uh, what I always say is. Um, it's all very well having your day in court, yeah. but litigation uh, is ne never a dead cert. You never know what's going to happen. You can have a judge who is in a bad mood, he wants to get to the golf course, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason, um, and you, you can just find that the case goes against you. Also, credibility is so important. You may not perform as you think you were going to perform in the witness box. Uh, you know, barristers are experienced at cross-examination and they can break somebody down and people can lose their tempers very easily and things get a bit murky in the, in the court. So um, it's always best, if you can, I think, to try to settle a claim. That's not to mean, that doesn't mean that we will always settle claims and we won't undervalue claims. There are certain times when you will actually go to court. But, um, you know, when you go into a trial, which can last four or five days, and it can be substantial costs involved in just dealing with that trial itself, uh, someone's going to lose. <laughs> it's a win or lose situation. Yes. Whereas at a mediation, it's not a win or lose situation, it's a compromise. Now, people do say to me, well, I'm not going to get as much as I would get if I went to court and won. And that, that is correct. On the other hand, some people just don't want the risk, particularly in personal injury cases where they're going to have to give evidence of what could be very traumatic events. And it's not really worth it to them to go through that experience if they can have 80% of what their best case is in their, in their pocket without any, any risks. So, so there's a time factor involved, there's a, a compensation factor involved. Is it, I also has heard as well, I don't know if this is true, but if, you, if your case is heard just before lunchtime, the judge is, like you say, he's wanting to get to the golf course and a little bit hungry and therefore is likely to be a bit more... Um, well, I mean, more... I, I have been in cases where judges have sat until half past eight at night as well oh, to okay, actually right. sort things out. So, um, but yes, there can be lots of different pressures. The lists actually, depending... Well, normally if it's a trial, it, you, you've got an allocated time. But if you've got an allocated time, you have to put down a time estimate and courts like to stick to the time estimate. So if you've put down an estimated time of, say, one day, okay. um, but... One particular cross-examination takes a long time or um, there's a lot of time spent dealing with one expert. You can start running out of time and a judge may say, well, you know, I've got another case tomorrow. I'm not going to be able to hear this case tomorrow. So if this case goes on, it won't be listed again for another three months, uh, which then means that all the evidence isn't so fresh. So you're sort of under pressure to get it through and you may not get all your points in. Yeah. Is there, I don't know if this is something that happens in the United Kingdom, but um, maybe more in Australia and the United States. But is there a bit of a backlash towards what people might say a compensation culture? Well, I don't think there ever has been a compensation culture, actually. Is that just something um, spread around in the red top news? It, it's something which has been spread around, yes. But I mean, we only deal with cases, particularly, well, the compensation culture is normally with personal injury sort of cases. Mm -hmm. People feel that. If they've been injured, they should be able to sue whatever. But it comes down to the advice that the solicitors give at an early stage. And there's lots of cases where I give the advice that I don't actually think there is the basis of a claim. I don't think a paving stone's uh, sufficiently raised, or I don't think that um, you've already got the basis of a claim because there were, there, uh, everything was done to try to avoid this accident. Yeah. Um, where people have suffered a personal injury or uh, clinical negligence, then my, my feeling is that they are entitled to pursue a claim if there's, if there's the proper basis of a claim there. I think people are more conscious of what their rights are. Uh, I don't think that's a compensation culture necessarily, it's an education. I, I would, yes, I would agree with that. It's more of an education factor because, you know, after a few beers, let's say down the pub, yeah. oh, such and such got 10 grand for falling over here, he only got yeah. five. But... Is there a misunderstanding about what compensation is? Yes, there is. And it's not just a lump sum to go and enjoy yourself in the Caribbean. 
No. And as you said, sometimes I will see somebody who will have been referred to me because I've had a successful case with someone they were happy yeah. with. And they've mentioned to someone, you know, go and see uh, Stephen Silverman about your case. He, 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 he's got the specialism. He dealt with my case. I was very happy with what I achieved. And they come in and I'll speak to them. And um, I'll always try to give an indication early on of roughly where your damages are going to fall. It's very, we, we can't do it without seeing the medical report, but we can give a rough idea by reference to tables and various things as to which, where the band falls. And uh, I did have one client said, oh, hang on a second. Uh, you got for my friend, she ended up with 200,000 pounds and you're telling me I, I could get 20 to 25. So I said, well, yes, but <laughs> your injury is totally different. <laughs> and she had loss of earnings and she had, she needed care and all those sort of things. And yeah, just, just didn't understand it. Also, when people come in to see me, they often don't know what they can claim. Yes. And one of the important things, particularly for a face-to-face interview, which is what I believe in, where um, if you go through some of these claims management companies, you go through a call centre, it, it's not quite the same. With a face-to-face interview, I can assess not only the merits of the case, but also the credibility. And by talking to somebody, you can come across various aspects that they didn't know they could claim for. So they may need physiotherapy and you can say, well, you can claim the cost of that if, it, if it's actually uh, yeah. an effect. They may need some form of care. Um, and we can try and get um, some care in place so so that they can have some help with the housework because they, they used to do the housework themselves and I don't know they can't do that. Um, or it may be that um, they've got some form of loss of earnings and some people don't even know that they could possibly claim for um, having to have a gardener uh, to do gardening if they used to do it themselves and as a result of their accident, now they can't. So... Um, we very much make sure that we're not there to uh, exaggerate claims. You have to make that clear. But we are there to make sure that all the various heads of compensation are included. Okay, so moving on then. Who is an ideal client then? (laughs) Well, obviously an ideal client, (laughs) really. uh, An ideal client, as far as personal injury is concerned, would be a motorcyclist. Who has had an who has had an accident and suffered severe injuries, and I have dealt with unfortunately I've seen quite a lot of motorcycle accidents in my time. And if you have an accident on a motorbike, it's normally going to be yeah. fairly bad injuries. Uh, as far as um, clinical negligence is concerned, um, if someone's settled a few cases recently involving a misdiagnosis, uh, a late diagnosis of um, cancer. Uh, I've also had another one which involved somebody who um, unfortunately suffered a stroke during an operation and any sort of major things which have gone wrong with treatment, then uh, that's um, it's obviously a good client for me. I'm sorry, sorry it's happened to any members of our audience. Yeah, um, but what I do find interesting, if I can just say, is yeah. the variety because you never really know what, what you're going to get next as far as accidents are concerned. And also... Um, but particularly with our personal injury and clinical negligence, quite often the issue is not whether there was liability for the accident, but the actual causation and what actually was caused, what injuries were caused, um, which can be a very important reason why you wouldn't want to settle a case too early as well, because you don't quite know well, how it's going to occur. Yeah. Complications may occur. So I've had cases, for instance, where somebody suffered a fractured ankle uh, working as a school teacher and um, early offers were made by the defendants, um, although there were some liability issues. Um, but I was concerned because in the initial report, it had indicated that she should be reviewed in a year's time. And um, there may be need for her to have a further operation if the ankle was not stable. And we could have settled the case with the offer that was on the table. It would have been fine for me because I was on the no win, no fee. But I actually said to the client, look, j- just hang on a bit because uh, you don't know how this is going to develop. And if you can't continue your work as a teacher, then that's going to be pretty drastic. Anyway, it so happened that further down the line, when she had the review, she did actually have to have... Um, uh, another operation with metalwork, etc., and she wasn't able to um, stand up doing teaching and had to. Although she continued in the teaching field, she had to 
change exactly what she was doing. Yeah. It was a much bigger claim, got a much larger sum of compensation for her than was on the table at the beginning, and um, much better result for the client. And so what, at what point then um, should people who, ha- who believe they have a claim um, come to speak to yourself? Well, I always advocate that you should come as soon as you can. Um, people have a fear about consulting solicitors. I mean, yes, I can. So understand. you can see we're sitting in this room that we actually call <laughs> it's it. Comfortable. We call it the music room because uh, it's a theme. One of our meeting rooms, we we decided to have a themed meeting room. Uh, this is the music room. Um, people come in and they feel they're very very concerned. They don't really know what to expect when they come in to see a solicitor they think the clock is ticking the minute they're walking through the door they they hear these terrible things about, <laughs> about how the clock is ticking and these huge astronomical hourly rates and what it's going to cost them so i will always offer a first no charge uh, meeting um, because it helps me i may not want to take the client on i may think the case isn't that strong i yeah. may think the client's perhaps not telling me the whole truth, or I may think their credibility, I don't know how they're going to fall in the witness box. So it gives me an opportunity to say, I'm very sorry, but I can't take every case on, and you know, there's no charge. At the same time, it gives them a chance to meet me. So at the end of a a completely non-committal meeting, if I say, look, I I would really like to help you, I think I can help you, I'd like to take your case on, but I, I always say there's no obligation, go away, and then let me know if you want to take it on. But I do find that having a room such as this, People feel more relaxed yes. early on and we can have a chat and we don't have to worry about being in a solicitor's office, which is quite often they're there for the first time. What's the, what are the advantages of um, someone with a claim coming to yourself rather than, say, picking up the phone after seeing a, a television ad? Um, well, I don't really want to bash the case management companies that, that advertise on the televisions, but um, one of the Great advantages is that you will have the initial face-to-face interview and I can pick up certain things uh, about that. But um, if you actually go through the uh, advertisements on television, you can quite often end up with a solicitor who may not be in the same town. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get that advantage of really uh, of the face-to-face interaction. Um, Also, if I don't quite understand how an accident worked, then I will go to the scene of the accident. Or if something develops in the case that um, I need to get over, uh, I need to get over a particular challenge, and then I'll go to the scene. And uh, yeah, for instance, there was one interesting uh, example I can share with you if you like, oh, which was um, a client of mine was on a push bike. She was a proficient cyclist and um, she was cycling along when she was hit from behind by a bus. It was a nasty accident because the wheels of the bus actually went over her legs. Oh, cool. So, um, Fortunately, she did survive, but it was, it was a nasty injuries. And um, the bus company said at a very early stage that they had CCTV footage on the bus, which actually showed that she changed lanes and she came from the right-hand side towards the left-hand side across the, the front of the bus and the bus didn't really have, the bus driver didn't have any chance to avoid her. And she said to me, no, I, I just wouldn't do that. I, I, you know, I, I, I've been cycling a long time. I know that route. I just wouldn't have done that, uh, certainly without any hand signals. So I went down to the scene uh, with her and uh, we looked at exactly where this accident happened. And it just so happened that at that, at that particular point, there was a bus stop um, about, about 50 yards away. And when the buses left that particular bus stop, there was a fork in the road uh, 100 yards down the road. And the buses at, particular, at that particular point would start to change lanes to go into that down that fork. I see. And so we went back to the office and we got the CCTV and we looked very carefully at it. And in fact, what was happening, it wasn't her going across the bus, it was the bus going into her lane. And so we were able to establish to the bus company that in fact this wasn't, didn't happen the way you said it happened. It happened in a completely different way and um, it was a liability. So the camera wasn't necessarily lying, it was more interpreting, interpreting. What, what you were seeing, but I don't think you would have got that unless you had necessarily got that, unless you went down to the scene of the accident and noted that all the buses at that particular point changed lanes. It was a, it was, it was a, a crucial factor in that case. So uh, that's one of the advantages, really, I think, of having somebody who's a, a local solicitor or someone who can go, go down and see, see the scene. And one other advantage of the face-to-face interview 
if you want to share it with you, Absolutely. is um, I had a client where I was about to settle a case. She had been knocked off a bicycle as well. And um, she said to me, is it okay if I claim for taxi first? I said, yes, if you weren't able to use your bicycle, you can claim for taxi first. So I said, well, how many taxi fares have you got? And it turned out she had hundreds of pounds worth of taxi fares. And the reason she had so many taxi fares was that she was working shifts and she finished work very late at night and whereas she would usually cycle home she now was scared to get on her bike because she had a phobia about cycling since the accident and so she had run up all these taxi fares so I said to her well what you know what, what is this phobia so she said well I, I, I just scared about getting back on my bicycle again so I said well we need to try and sort this out if we can I phoned the insurers and I said look you know she's got this real concern about getting back on the bike um, it's quite a claim for taxi fares. I was going to be continuing if she doesn't get back on her bike. Uh, will you pay for her to have some uh, CBT treatments and counselling? And they said, yeah, if she goes, she's assessed for it. So I sent her along to a CBT expert. Uh, he actually um, assessed her as needing some counselling for this, uh, for travel anxiety. Um, and I think it was in, within about 10 sessions she was able to get back on the bike. And, you know, to her, getting back on the bike was the most important part of that case mm. to her. It wasn't the damage. It was being able to cycle back from work again. It meant a lot to her. I can <laughs> imagine. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, well, I think if you ask anyone, it's, it's more about your health, isn't it? And being back to the way you were before. Yes, well, that's, that's what we try to achieve, try to get people. And in fact, one of the things I haven't mentioned is the importance that I place on rehabilitation. Mm. So um, I do try to get early interim payments to get people back uh, on their feet um, or to improve their quality of life at an early stage. So uh, Rather did, than having things to drag out. Rather than drag time. out, yes, because uh, it can also actually um, help the insurers. It can reduce the damages if we can get them treated at an early stage. Because quite often conditions can become very chronic before you're actually, if you delay in the treatment. So just finally then, um, what's the most interesting case you've ever worked on that you're allowed to tell us about? Um, well, of course, Clark Confidential is <laughs> <it's> always paramount. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a number of interesting cases I've had, quite amusing ones as, as, uh, as well. Um, one interesting case uh, which involved a number of issues mm. involved a a pizza delivery guy who was on his motorbike and went to a block of flats late at night to deliver a pizza. So it happened that the flats were above um, some shops and to get up to the flats, uh, he had to go up a stone staircase, which he did. Uh, it was dark. He started walking uh, around the walkway, which went past the, the flats. And as he went around a corner, he suddenly fell down another stair, stone staircase. And it was, it was a steep staircase and it, it was nasty. He suffered nasty injuries. Um, the staircase wasn't lit. There was no lighting. So he came to see me and I thought, well, this is a fairly straightforward case. <laughs> no wind, no fee. Yeah, very straightforward case. And when we did our investigations, normally the common parts, as we call them, or that walkway would have been uh, the responsibility of the freeholder, and you know, managing agent or something. When we actually did our research, it turned out that the freehold for those stairs were at, was actually part of the um, uh, of the flat owner's responsibility. So the flat owner had a lease. I see. Okay. Uh, and as part of his demise, part of the lease, he was responsible for maintaining the stairs, which was actually a very onerous lease. I don't, I don't know who advised him on that. It was very onerous. It wasn't anything to do with us. So, uh, so we had a claim against the flat owner. Uh, however, uh, did he have insurance? So he contacted the flat owner, eventually did manage to trace him um, because he was a bit elusive. Turned out that uh, he didn't have any insurance in place. Um, he, he didn't have any uh, insurance to, to cover him for that and not only that he was bankrupt uh, oh, okay. so a lot of solicitors at that stage would have said well I'm very sorry but we've come to sort of a bit of dead end because um, we've got no one we can enforce any judgment against however um, because he was bankrupt there was a trustee in bankruptcy on the scene and uh, trustees in bankruptcy do have quite onerous obligations and one of their obligations is that they have to make sure that their bankrupt has sufficient insurance in place 
And so um, they, they hadn't. And so we decided to pursue the trustee in bankruptcy right. who owned up and said, yes, you're right. Uh, I've been negligent. And um, how much do you want? <laughs> so, as simple as that. Well, sort of like that was how it ended. So the client did end up with substantial damages. Uh, the pizza never recovered. <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, that was quite. That was an interesting. That was a very interesting sort of claim because it involves so much, and that's why you never really know quite where you're going with claims. You never have a dead cert claim. Brilliant. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for your time. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice speaking to you. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back. That was really good hearing from Stephen. So, John, um, you spent a bit of time with him, um, not just obviously the recording bit, but what were the major things that you learned? There was a lot. I mean, he's, he's obviously been in business a, a, a great, you know, he's, he's been in business for a long time. He's um, had a number of different, quite very interesting cases that he's worked on, not just with commercial and business, but, um, you know, with, with litigation and different disputes. So he's someone who has a, lot, a big well, a big finger on the pulse, should we say? Yeah. No sniggering. Um, and so basically, I think from that kind of health and safety and procedural point of view, there's some really good points and really good takeaway parts from that. Um, how to avoid getting into those those mm-hmm. those, um, those uh, bits and pieces is, is a major key, isn't it? Do you have the right processes within your business that you, when you're walking into someone's home, you are taping things down? You know, mm-hmm. if there are young children in the area, you're not letting them loose with your power tools. Yeah. Let's face it. I mean, these things sound obvious, don't they? But at yeah. the time when you walk in, and I suppose you're in the bit of the headlines, it's a new customer or client, um, you might just be a bit, you know, a bit like that rabbit and just get on with things and do things a bit nervous. But actually, what, where's the process? How do you get through that to make sure that that job is then a success and you're mm. not left with a lawsuit at the end of it? Do you know what? And I think in America, it's probably a lot more common than it is in the UK. Mm. Um, but you're absolutely right. And I think the trades sort of in the infancy of their own business, they don't think about these things. Um, and it's not a criticism. It's just because you're thinking about you know, getting home, completing the job, you know, getting everything right. Um, but starting with things like terms and conditions on your website, Completely. starting with things like your operational processes. So if you're doing a quote, I know there's different softwares out there now um, that allow you to actually fill in a method statement or a risk assessment. So before you've even done the quote, you know, you've kind of said to the customer, actually, this part needs to be removed or this area needs to be covered. Um, even your own then working process, if it's putting down different floor coverings, um, before and after photos of the full area, which can then be stored via Dropbox or on that specific job software. There's so many different elements that don't actually add a lot of time to the jobs. But as you said, and as Stephen mentioned in that podcast, cover you in terms of if there was a legal issue, it's not about emotional, it's not about trying to remember, it's well, actually, there's the pictures of us covering the floors. There's a video of the previous damage to that tile before we did the actual job. Um, but trying to get businesses and trades specifically to start thinking about this now, it doesn't add a lot of time to the jobs. And even without the cost of a software, I know for a long period of time, we work with businesses that just simply, we set up different WhatsApp groups for the specific engineers and they would send their before and after photos, before and after videos, which we could then save into storage um, and the offices on a desktop. So it's some very easy, quick wins yeah. just to kind of give you that extra additional cover. And that, that can be, I was completely, yeah, and it can be automated as well. I mean, I've, I've worked with um, uh, pest control businesses, which have this all set up. And so that they're doing a site survey and within two minutes after they've left, you've got a full PDF with images and points about, you know, what needs to be taken action on, uh, what they've done, um, what they would suggest. And also as well, attached to that, a price list mm-hmm. of how yeah. to put it all right. So instantaneously, you've got that list. You can make a decision as a customer. Um, and that, that's not something that's difficult in this, this day and age to kind of set up and get running as well. Even to a point where... Um, when um, one particular uh, pest controller had been in, had given that report, their next door neighbour, who actually had started out with the problem with rats in the loft, who was a council uh, house, um, they were just able then to pass on that report to the council and their own pest control people were able to see what the problem was. It got dealt with 10 times quicker than if you've had to send someone out to actually do another exploration. So open it up though, I mean, first of all, there's two sides of it. One side of it is, how professional do you look when you're doing these things oh, from a branding perspective? Massive. Yeah, exactly what I was going to say. And secondly, if you're trying to boost sales and you've got these elements in place already, when we've worked, even though we've been a large company, we've still subcontracted off bigger companies like um, HomeServe or HelpLink for argument's sake. 
and the health and safety that they have in place there is, in your eyes, kind of over the top. But when you start to see it in play, it's completely mm -hmm. necessary. So even sort of two small things, your power tools, are they being pat tested once a year? And the other thing is the portable RCDs. So if you are using the customer's electricity, you can plug it in, but that plug works as a secondary RCD, which protects you, protects the customers. Those two small things in themselves with a before and after picture make such a difference to how you look as an organization, how that reflects on the main contractor you're working for. And again, to bring it back, how good that makes your business look from a branding perspective. I've got a client um, that we, we designed up his terms and conditions and he goes out to domestic homes, him and his team, they must see about five to 10 different homes a day. And um, he goes through the TNCs with the client, he signs it there and then, as does the client. All right, he put a lot of time and effort in to start, but you do that once. Yeah. And he occasionally comes back to me and he'll say, oh, Georgia, can we just add in this now? And now can we just add in this? And it's just a case of adding on and bolting on the new parts of his business. And when then there are problems that have happened, because naturally in every trades and construction business, something's going to go wrong, right? Oh, the client yeah. is always relieved mm. to know they're in the best possible hands. And one of tradespeople's biggest um pain points is that you're kind of tarnished with this whole cowboy trades right mm. and especially with the domestic um client they're super conscious of this to start with but when someone's rocking up looking the part sounding the part having all the paperwork ready they're signing it they're talking through the specific parts or oh, this part will affect you I just want to explain this before the job happens that's you're kind of getting rid of a whole heap of problems before you've even started and like you said in terms of your brand and visibility um, for a business, your professionalism just skyrockets. I was given a great piece of advice when I first started out saying, you know, if, if people can understand the agreement at the beginning, that sets out all the principles, mm -hmm. makes the job uh, go a lot smoother. But also as well, you know, things, real world, things will go wrong, mm -hmm. but it's more about your metal as a business owner, about how you yeah. solve those problems, own up to those problems if it is you, and actually get past those hurdles. And that is what really stands you out as a business. 100% and having those kind of elements and that level of protection or professionalism in place is the difference between you getting that one star review and not or the difference of you saving the day and still keeping that customer so look John thanks for speaking to Stephen and we'll see you guys on the next one that's all for this time but don't worry we'll be back with more soon stay tuned for new episodes at marketingsimplified.co.uk